Let's go back in time. Sea of Cortez, Mexico, 1950. Probably quite a wonderful place for a walk on the beach. And lucky for us, and lucky for Vaquita, there were a couple of pretty smart chaps on the beach, in and around San Felipe, Baja, having a stroll, and they stumbled across some skulls. Now, some people, when they find skulls, might make them sort of step back. When biologists find skulls, it's a bit like Christmas. And in fact, not only do they sort of jump for joy internally, but they do everything they can to measure, monitor, record, and then compare. And that's what these two chaps did. And they measured the skulls, and the differences they found to harbor porpoise were astonishing. And in fact, this became the first scientific description of vaquita. It was published in 1958 by Norris and McFarland. And they said, it's a bit difficult to read, that this description could not be referred to as Focina Focina, or harbor porpoise. This was published in the Journal of Mammalogy. And in fact, they had described a new species. And they called this species Focina sinus. Sinus, in Latin, means bay or gulf, and they couldn't have picked a better name that describes the description of this very small, very rare marine mammal. It is, in fact, known only from the upper reaches of the Gulf of California, Mexico, also known as the Sea of Cortez. And less than 40 years later, it was declared endangered in Mexico in 1994. So we went from the excitement of scientific discovery to the disheartenment of discovering that this species is in decline and is endangered. Now the distribution, I'll show you here, this is just a little bit more blown up. The entire global range for this animal is about 4,000 square kilometers. That little bit right there. So in terms of conservation actions, we really are focusing on a very small piece of the Earth. In fact, if you do the math, we're looking at less than one one thousandth of the surface area of the Earth's oceans that we need to act in to save this species. And here are some very rare photographs of living vaquita. And you can see right away, although they are these small, difficult to find marine mammals, they've got these really large dorsal fins I was thrilled when I joined the Vaquita expedition, not, not just because I was on the Vaquita expedition, but because they had such prominent dorsal fins, and I was so used to spending days upon days looking for the tiny fins of harbor porpoise. And in fact, these animals' fins are much bigger and much easier to spot. It was delightful. But they are difficult to find, and I love this photograph because you can see the Vaquita's face. That's very rare. But also look at what's beside it. It's a gull. And you can see how big the gull looks in comparison to the vaquita. And because they are so rare and because they are so difficult to find, we really know very little of the biology or the ecology of this species. We really don't understand what its role is in the Sea of Cortez ecosystems, what the trophic linkages are, and what truthfully would happen if it vanished. Would we notice? Would the ecosystem notice? And would the people who live along the shores of the Sea of Cortez notice? And would the rest of us here in British Columbia notice? Perhaps not. But just because we don't know and we aren't sure, to me, is not a reason that we should sit down and put our hands up and say, well, this is a bit difficult. Putting people on the moon is a bit difficult. Protecting a very small piece of the ocean is also difficult, but it's doable, just like putting people on the moon. So what do we know? What do we know about these animals? Well, generally, they are smaller than a harbor porpoise at about five feet in length at maturity. They do have very similar coloration to harbor porpoise, which makes it difficult if you're looking for them you know, in overcast skies when the sea might be gray. But luckily, they're in the Sea of Cortez. Gets a bit more sunshine than we do here. We do know that they have this very restricted range. And we also know that there are no subspecies. This is it. And ironically, their habitat is relatively clean and healthy. But they are in a precipitous decline. 
Here we have some data showing the population size. And I wish I could tell you that the, uh, the population size numbers had been abbreviated to make room on the slide, and it, but they haven't. It isn't 200,000 or 600,000. It really is 200 up to 1,000 animals. And you can see in the 1990s, we had around 700 animals, and we have managed to bring them down to less than 200, with a current rate of decline estimated at just under 20% per year. There's not a lot of room to move. So why is this happening? What's going on down there? Well, entanglements in fishing gear, and particularly in gillnets. However, as with all things conservation, there is controversy. There are people, um, there are thoughts that perhaps um, pollution is a culprit, or that the significant changes to the ecosystem because the amount of fresh water flowing from the Colorado River is greatly reduced and therefore has changed that estuarine system may also be a culprit. But we also know that the animals that have been found along the shores or have been turned in did not show signs of emaciation. They did not show signs of um, environmental stressors. They were healthy animals. They looked good. They looked really good. But some of them were entangled, and some of them had the marks of entanglement. If we lose the Sea of Cortez population, there is no other to repopulate. This species will be gone forever. And that's it. The mortality for vaquita is indiscriminate. The nets, the nets don't choose. They take cow-calf pairs. They take little ones. They take groups. So which fishery is it? What's happening? The fisheries-related mortality often relates to the Totuaba fishery. And the estimated bycatch in the 1980s up to the early 1990s was estimated at 58 animals per year. But this has been going on since the 1930s. So what was happening before records were kept? What was the rate back then? We don't know. There was another estimate done in 1993, this time based on fishermen interviews. And usually when you interview fishermen, you tend to get estimates that are lower than other information sources in terms of um, bycatch. But in this case, sadly, the estimate jumped to 78 animals per year. And those are the, the honest fishermen, the ones who are working hard to make a living. What about the illegal fishing? And we know it's happening. We know it's definitely there. For the Totuaba swim bladder, the current black market price is around 8,500 US dollars per kilogram. This is what I'm told. That means you're looking at 10 to 20,000 dollars US dollars per fish. There's a lot of reason to try and make some money if you're struggling, and this is the way to do it. And where's it going? It's going to Asia. But there are recovery efforts. It's not all doom and gloom. There's a lot of good people doing a lot of good work to help Vaquita. Um, the North American Conservation Action Plan was drafted and accepted. It's known as the NACAP, and it is a trinational document between Canada, the United States, and Mexico. And its purpose was to support Mexican conservation efforts. And in 2008, there was the trinational, same three countries, effort to find where are the last vaquita, and how many are there? And this was all done aboard this vessel, the David Starr Jordan. It was international scientific cooperation. It was a fantastic expedition to be on with people who all came together for, for one species to answer the questions of where are they? Are they still there, and how many? And it was a, it was a success. And in fact, in one day, we managed to find half of the existing population that is both exciting and terribly depressing at the same time. We did both visual and acoustic monitoring. 
using the big eyes. Uh, these binoculars allow you to see for six miles. And I'll tell you, after you spend about 20 to 30 minutes staring through those and then you step away, it, it, you lose your balance for a few minutes. But they sure help you spot the vaquita. And we were able to cover the entire range. And living vaquita were sighted and living vaquita were heard. And with some of the smaller vessel efforts, we got some of the most fantastic photographs ever taken of wild vaquita. And these are all on the web, well, not all. There are many of them on the web that are for use in uh, conservation efforts. There have also been extensive conservation actions. Um, the creation of the International Committee for the Recovery of Vaquita, or CERVA, uh, and it's a, a scientific effort to try and um, put together the best available science to understand what's going on, but put it out there in the realm for conservation. Um, there's also been the, um, massive species conservation actions in Mexico. In fact, Vaquita topped the list, and there has been gillnet enforcement bans in the bio biosphere reserve and the refuge area. There has been an encouragement for alternative fishing methods, and in many cases this has been um, quite successful and also a program for economic compensation for fishermen. However, there have been recommendations from CERVA that the vaquita is in imminent danger of extinction and emergency regulations are required. We do not have time for meeting after meeting after meeting with committee and subcommittees. We have to act. And CERVA has strongly recommended that the government of Mexico enact these emergency regulations for a gillnet exclusion zone covering the full range of Akita, not just the, re the refuge. And I can tell you from having been there, when you're in the refuge at night, when you look at the radar screen, and the refuge is not, um, you know, it's not a circle, it's not an, an easy geometric figure, but on the radar screen, you can see it perfectly outlined. So what would the radar be detecting? Fishing vessel activity right to the border. So. Here you can see the refuge and the gillnet exclusion zone and the vaquita distribution. So if we can make the exclusion zone bigger than the distribution, when the number one factor for the decline of this population, this species, is a single thing, we really stand a good chance of saving them. And there have been successes. Going back into the 19, early 1990s, the creation of the Biosphere Reserve was a great step forward for Mexican conservation. And the refuge is essentially now free of entangling nets and shrimp trawlers in the refuge. At least 230 of their artisanal boats have withdrawn from fishing activities in the region. And a minimum of 105 artisanal boats are participating in gear replacement programs. And these numbers are a little bit old, so in fact they actually could be quite high much higher. And last year, there were 17 traffickers arrested in the region. And it is the largest ever conservation program in Mexico. And last year, the government announced a proposed two-year ban. And I just found out yesterday that this will be implemented in March, next month. Well done, Mexico. However, what is our current population estimate? Less than 100. Our window is closing. And it is time to act. There's no question. So what can we do? Well, the first thing I think we should do is commend Mexico's efforts. I think all Canadians should be tourists in Mexico. Let's go. Let's go support the country and support Makita, especially in February. Let's do it. But we can also do things throughout the year. We make decisions at the grocery store that have international ramifications, and we need to shop well. If you're buying fish and shrimp from Mexico, make sure it's been caught with methods other than gill nets. So what are we looking at? Trawls, long lines, hooks, line gear. The Vikita do need our help, there's no question. Uh, there's been some very interesting um, and innovative research using drones. This has just been started. Um, also for monitoring in the Sea of Cortez. We need to support these types of initiatives. And Mexico has proposed $37 million plan for this conservation. And mark your calendars, everybody. July the 11th is International Save the Vaquita Day. Google it and participate. So as I said, 
This is not my work. This is work of other people. And I wish to thank all of them, in particular the people who are on the ground in Mexico who make their lives there, the fishermen who are making these day-to-day -day decisions, um, not only if they catch them and turn them in, but also to make the decisions to switch their gear and move to Vaquita-friendly technologies. Um, and I've included you because I hope I have inspired people to act. And I, for those of you here, I do have um, a brochure that's been put together with a bit of information about Vaquita, but also what you can do with some really good web links. Um, here are some of the groups that are working for Vaquita on a day-to-day -day basis. And thank you all for your time and attention.